Okay. Oh. Now you're going to have to talk really loud because I'm on the end. Now we're going we're gonna to tell you what God made each day of creation. On the first oh. day, God, God created, created a On the first day, God created the light and the dark. The first day, the light and the dark. The light was day and the dark was night. On the second day, God created the sky to separate the waters. On the third day, God created land and seas, plants, plants and, and trees. On the fourth day, God created the sun and the moon. On the fifth day, God created the fish and the birds. On the sixth day, God created the animals and man. On the seventh day, God rested. Now we're going to sing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. Well, I, I had my own little song I was going to sing for you now, hand motions and everything. I, I hope we're not. Well, wasn't that cool? Who enjoyed that, huh? That was neat, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. Now i got to follow that somehow. But uh, Tom pointed out something to me that it looks like Daniel's odds are pretty good. I mean, he was the only guy up there in the whole bunch. <laughs> however, however... If he doesn't learn to give a little personal space, <laughs> I have a feeling, well, it's not going to go over very well. But no, that was good. I, I, I enjoyed that. I appreciate it. Again, as, as we come up to talking about children's and youth ministries, that's what this stuff is about. It's not, it's not about uh, cranking out specific numbers or anything. This is about ministering to God, ministering to these children, and allowing them to give praise to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in that way. Wasn't that fantastic? Although that was a little bit more out of the routine, we're going to get right back into the routine. Okay, Can it, did anybody have any guesses this week on what verse I was going to read? I'd say verse. 
Are you guys awake yet? I said what verse I was going to read. You guys said 24. That's the chapter. That's the chapter, Proverbs chapter 24. The middle one, the whole thing. Okay. Okay. You guys are giving me a spoonful of my own medicine here. Go to verse 3. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. You know, we talk about creation and how God is, is the, the essence, the origin of everything. He, he's even the origin of our eternal life this morning, and that's why we're gathering. That's why we're here. Jesus Christ has offered eternal life to those who will put their faith in him. And after we start that journey of faith, after we start that journey of faith, there are opportunities after opportunities, continual chances to come and worship him and show him that he is our father and we are his children. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 3. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Now we're reading the book of Proverbs. The investment that we're to make is into wisdom, into godly wisdom, into the Lord's knowledge. That's what we're to invest to. And one way we can invest into what is wise is by investing our physical finances as well as everything else. So this is just another opportunity to challenge you, challenge you to look back on your week, look ahead at what you have coming. I'm not just talking about here Sunday morning and passing the plate. I'm talking about overall, overall, we need to be assessing our lives and asking, are we investing into those things of the kingdom or are we investing into our own pleasures? Now, we're told in Scripture that you know, if we work hard, now there's a key we don't like to remember very much. But we're told if we work hard, if we work, then we get to enjoy the fruits of our labors. There's nothing wrong with kicking back. There's nothing wrong with taking it easy. But it's expected that we're all going to work. And with that expectation and that anticipation is, is a priority that says, and you will give to the Lord. You will give to the needs of the poor around you. So I just want you to take this opportunity. You, you read these verses about building a house, filling these chambers, or if you will, these tre this treasure chest with all sorts of pleasant substances. The, the, most, the most precious resource is not going to be finances at the end of the world. That's not going to be the highest value. All this money is going to burn. Whenever the Lord returns and destroys this world, happy thoughts for the day. Whenever the Lord, which is a happy thought for me, because when the Lord returns, guess where I'm going? How often, and this, this is the specific challenge I'm going to leave you with this morning. How often do you take to put your finances in front of eternity? Have you ever put your finances in front of eternity? Have you ever considered how insignificant your income really is in the long run? Say, Mike, it feels kind of significant right now. Got bills I need to pay. What are you talking about? <laughs> Hey, been there, done that. I understand what's going on. I know it's tough, but you need to step back. You and I need to step back. And we've got to realize just how insignificant our finances will be when we stand before the Lord. He's not going to ask about amounts. He's going to ask what we did with what he gave us. That's what he's going to ask. The significance of our finances right now is only going to be found in what we did with what God gave us. What we, were we responsible with it? Did we give as he called us to give in tithe? Did he give as he called us to give in offering? Did, he, did we give as he called us to give to the expansion of the church around the world? Whether through an offering plate here or individual to individual, whether you support a missionary on your own or however the Lord leads you to do it, you need to give as the Lord directs you because that's what you're going to answer for. That's what you and I are going to answer for whenever we stand before God is how we built the house. He, see, we're told the church, this is the house he's building. The church, the church around the world, that's, that's his structure he's building. And the way we build that, how we are responsible with the way we build that, that's what we'll be held accountable for. So I just ask you to use this time as we pray to look at your finances in a perspective of eternity and make sure you and your family are spending and investing the way God's called you to spend and invest. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you. We thank you for all of our resources you've given us. Heavenly Father, you're an amazing and generous God. 
May we give as you've called us to give, not as we feel, not as we're comfortable, but as you call us to give, as you prompt us to give. May we be obedient, knowing that you continue to provide. We've all seen you provide, Lord, and we thank you for that. And we trust you right now with this form of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. As we thank God and praise God for who he is, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures dear below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy I turned on the TV one Monday evening and turned to CBN, which was then a national network. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening, and they were running a revival series from First Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. It was my first time. It was live, too. It was my first time ever seeing Charles Stanley. Well, I have watched him ever since. Most of what people know about Charles Stanley is simply that he's a, a world famous <coughs> preacher. He's had a great congregation, has a great congregation still in Atlanta, Georgia. But all oh, if you knew his life. If you knew where he was raised and how. If you knew the great disappointments that came to his life in the 1990s when his family disowned him for all intents and purposes. His own son and daughter wouldn't speak to him. That's since been healed, thank goodness. 
but Charles Stanley would tell you his favorite hymn in the hymn book. His number in our hymn book is number 737. It was a hymn that his music director knew to sing on certain nights and certain days for the congregation, like a river glorious, is God's perfect peace. book of 1 Corinthians, where Paul writes instructions to the church on how we're to conduct ourselves when we gather for the Lord's Supper, and uh, we're familiar with that. We read it a, a lot, and we're kind of striving to do, follow his instruction. Same thing was happening in the Corinthian church. They were making progress here, maybe a year later, and changed some of the things they were doing, I think, even though they still had some problems, but... Uh, and Paul writes them again, well, probably within the same year, but at least several months later, <clears throat> he kind of tells them the same thing and puts a little more onto it. And we don't say this or read this one uh, very often. It says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith and test yourself. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? Those are pretty harsh uh, words here. I think, um, you know, we, we sang the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's probably one of the favorites of this church, I think. I th the guys in the sound booth had a decibel meter. When we sing that, it seemed like it, people really kind of get into that. And it's so happens it's one of my favorites also. It seemed like it happens a lot when I serve at the table. I don't know why that is, but it seemed like God kind of works that out. But anyway, in the, in the matter of, of, of examining yourself, and, and we sing it as well, uh, with my soul, in, in reality, there are going to be people who fail the test. Jesus made it clear in the, in the parable about the sheep of the goats that a lot of people just tried to deceive God, 
And they tried to deceive themselves because they weren't honest with them. They didn't test themselves. Do you meet the do you meet the 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 qualifications, so to speak, of a believer? Sad to say, crowd this side, there there are people who are standing here singing at the top of their lungs, it is well with my soul. And yet they they are it is not. And and, and, and people go through those seasons, to be honest with you, everybody does. You go through that season, you seem a, it seems a, a little dry and and the Lord, in, in his wisdom, uh, changes circumstances around you to, to redeem you again. So you're, you're redeemed for eternity only once, but you're restored with a, with a newer, fresher walk with him uh, day by day or week by week. So as you uh, uh, take this, this body and, and this blood of Jesus, and, and you examine yourself and you, and you find yourself in that dry spot, maybe there's things that, that you need to, uh, to address. And that's what the test is for, to see how much you, you're really uh, learning and, and growing. And there's not much we can uh, do to that, but we, we certainly want to be found uh, faithful when it comes that, to that time. Okay. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you this morning. We want to thank you that... Uh, set aside this time in your service to just meditate on you that we can close out the busyness of this world and that for just a moment we can remember why it is well with our soul because of your death burial and resurrection lord we just thank you for all you did for us you didn't have to do it but yet you did it anyway just be with us the rest of this day and thank you for this time in jesus name i say this amen
Thank you.
Um, I have to run back to toddlers, so VBS t-shirts, I need them ordered by next week. They're $7.50. That says seven, seven fifty. Um, they're a pretty periwinkle blue, and then they have a cross on the back that says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. It's one of our verses for VBS. And then meet up here after church if you want to help with anything or help me paint the backdrop because that's going to be a big project. So thanks. All right, VBS is coming up. Get signed up as soon as possible. Children are now dismissed for Children's Church. If you wonder, if you wonder why I'm so proud of being able to say that, it's because I didn't remember to dismiss Children's Church for like the first three months I was here. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of myself when I remember to do my job. So <laughs> as the children are leaving, if you take your Bibles with you and go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 this morning. We're taking another look at what in the world we're called to do as Christians. We, we have a news feed. We watch people behind a news desk tell us what's going on, and they'll call in experts, and they'll try to explain what we should be doing about it. And I want to know where the Christians are at. We're apologizing half the time. We're apologizing for our beliefs. We're apologizing for our convictions on way too many things, and we're stepping out, and we're saying, yeah, I'll let the experts handle that. Okay, well, listen, the expert's right here. We're going to read what he has to say. If you'd please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Romans chapter 12. The Lord will point us in the right direction this morning. Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't, don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Chapter 13, verse 1. We're going to read the first seven verses. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, well, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Verse 5. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. In our final verse this morning, before we pray... Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Please remain standing as we go before the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you right now for another opportunity to worship you. Lord, we confess how many times we've apologized to this world system whenever we were to be taking a stand for you. Lord, may we stand firm. Whenever we ask what's going on in the world, may we see your hand at work and see what you want us to be doing to show people where your hand is at, where you're leading us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We got one more week. One more me week of, uh, of a news desk up here. I know this isn't really a news desk. Um, this is the best I could do. Um, actually, uh, Gene and Jill Nelson were very gracious because I had to apologize to them after the fact because I never asked if I could use this. This is what the television was standing on in the Sunday school classroom. 
I replaced it. There's another plastic table up there. Everything's cool, but you know, I, I'm learning around here, you just do things and you ask forgiveness later, right? Isn't that the way it's supposed to work? All the elders are frowning at me. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. What do we do with terrorism? Now, I've tried to cover all the hot topics we're seeing on the news. I've looked for what is trending the most. What did we talk about the first week? Politics. Specifically, what area of politics did we do? The, the messiest part of it right now is, of politics is probably seen in the presidential election. You guys don't even want to say it anymore. You're like, Mike, this is Sunday. Please, we'll talk about it. No, we need to talk about it. If we're not talking about it, everybody else is, and they're going to draw their own conclusions, and they're going to lead in this arena. We should be the ones leading and letting people know Jesus Christ is our king. We will honor these earthly authorities, but Jesus Christ has the final say. We're not waiting on polls to find out if Jesus will be king. He is king and will remain king for all eternity. That's where we stand here, okay? And we stand by that authority, not because of anything I've said, and not because of the tradition of this church, but because of the living word of God. That's why we are where we are right now. So what did we talk about last week? Rights. Rights. And, and what is the, uh, I named one, one international human right. What does every human have the right to from birth? Oh, good. All right. Good. All right. We're off to a good start. And you're absolutely right. From what we see in God's word, unfortunately, and it should break our hearts, when we're born into this world, the only thing we have a right to do is to die. And I didn't get into the conversation of the age of accountability and things like this as far as little kids and what happens when the Lord calls them home. That's a very serious topic, and I'll just give you a, a brief touchdown on this, and that is uh, I believe that if a child is called home before they are able to reason what is right and wrong, they don't have that ability developed yet. I believe they do go home to be with the Lord. I see that pretty clear in Scripture. So I, I, that was one of those things I didn't touch on when we talk about death. That's one of those uh, subjects that a lot of churches answer different ways. So I do want to say everybody here is destined for death. But I do believe that if the Lord calls a child home before they have that opportunity to make a conscious decision to follow Christ, they're, they're, they're not developed to that point, I believe the Lord takes them home to be with him. That's what I see in Scripture. So I just wanted to speak that word of comfort as we touched on that subject last week. I didn't really fill in that gap. But this week, let's go on to something a little lighter. Let's talk about terrorism. Now, next week, just to give you a heads up, next week will be the last one, and we're going to talk about natural disasters, okay? So we'll, we'll kind of start. Uh, that it, it, these, these are all potentially painful, but we've got to talk about them because this is what's going on. We're going to talk about earthquakes and floods and tornadoes and wildfires. There's all kinds of stuff going on in this world that are hurting a lot of people, and the church, for the most part, when they've tried to speak up, there's been backlash against it. Guess what? From the world system saying, you can't say that, and did you think about these people, and you're not, you're not being, uh, you know, compassionate enough towards these people, and when you said this, it offended these people, and I'm saying, all right, stop. If we want to talk about offense, Let's look at the ministry of Jesus Christ. He had the reverse flip model of ministry. He started out with close to tens of thousands hearing his debut sermon on the mount. And by the time he was done, not even Peter, the most passionate of his disciples, was hanging around. There was very few there at the cross. We're called to reach the lost and disciple them through Jesus Christ. We're not called to get a big following. That's not what, that wasn't Jesus' mission. But guess what? I hope to take as many people with me as I can into heaven. That's the plan. So when we talk about terrorism, it gets tricky because normally with the issue of terrorism, there, there seems to be a correlation between, between terrorism and religion. Even the terrorism the United States saw in the, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century uh, was related to different union causes in some cases that had a religious extreme side. You know, there, whereas the majority of the Union wasn't getting too extreme here in the United States. And I've got a list. You say, Mike, what are you talking about? Well, in case you don't know, a, a lot of the terrorism acts committed here in the United States around the turn of the 19th and 20th century were committed by essentially what was a, a type of mobster or mafia at that point in time. Uh, some of the more interesting ones, um, I've got a list of, of every terrorist activity. And yes, I, I keep this on file. I just, I, I, I'm interested, to me, this is part of the heartbeat of the nation to find out uh, what's going on. Now, 
September 16, 1920, a bomb in a horse-drawn carriage exploded near Morgan Bank in Lower Manhattan, New York City, 1920. A bomb in a horse carriage. So if you think terrorism is something new, uh, it's been around the world and it's been around this country for a long time. Now, I'm just talking about this country specifically this morning because that's what hits home the closest to us. And uh, May 18, 1927, in Bath, Michigan, there was an explosion in a school house, 46 killed. 1928. I, I got list after list, and I didn't want to, uh, you know, bring the whole place down with all these numbers, but I wanted to point out to me those were interesting because they seemed so long ago. But evil's been around. There's nothing new under the sun. We think of terrorism. What is the very first date that pops into your head? 9-11. And based on this list, that was, that was the most deaths we saw in this country related directly to terrorism. At this point in time, they've tallied 2,759 people lost their lives in those terrorist attacks. Even in Wichita, Kansas, where I'm from. I grew up in Wichita. And unfortunately, there was one thing Wichita was known for in the 90s, and that was we had the world's leading professional late-term abortions. And uh, while we were out in Tennessee, while Libby and I were out in Tennessee, May 31st of 2009, he was shot while standing out in the foyer of a church because he was a deacon. He was a leader. Well, this can get a little messy. Because when we talk about terrorism, we generally are thinking of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, organizations like this, and that is absolutely correct. These are terrorists. The Federal Bureau of Investigation defined terrorism for us this morning. See, it's all over the news. That's why I want to talk about it. There, there's small terrorist attacks, and then there's large terrorist attacks going on all the time. We only see certain ones that make the mainstream. There is, there is terrorism taking place all the time. It's some smaller group's way of intimidating the government to go the way they want it to go, and most of the time they know if they can intimidate the civilization, they can intimidate the population into giving up their freedom for the sake of security. They've already started to win the war. They can get people scared. FBI defines terrorism as the unlawful use of force or violence against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population, or any segment thereof in furtherance of political or social objectives. Well, I've got an act of terrorism. We're going to talk about ISIS here in a minute, but we've got, I've got an act of terrorism I wanted to make you aware of. But before I get to that act of terrorism, I want us to be reminded who created us this morning. Who created us? God. Who gets to define life this morning? When does God say that life begins in Scripture? There we go, there we go, all kinds of different answers. What I see in Scripture is that life begins at conception. God knew us before we were even conceived. We're told that in Scripture. So if that's the definition of life, then I think we've got another terrorist activity we need to talk about because there have been millions and millions of people who have been killed for the sake of of pursuing a social agenda. A social agenda for humanity to say, we've got the right to decide what is right and wrong. We don't need to listen to God's rules. Let me give you a number. 57,762,169 murders here in the United States. Where do you think we find this number? Abortion. Oh, we don't like to talk about abortion. Mike, that's a women's rights issue. Okay, I think we covered that last week. We covered that last week. What we have the right to do is determined by our, by our creator, not by ourselves. We can't create a, a 
think tank committee smart enough to outsmart God and say, we've got it figured out now. Who wants to be on that think tank committee? I, I want us to think about this because we take the issue of abortion and we immediately shuffle it under women's rights and it doesn't belong there. It doesn't belong there. That issue belongs under what is right, what is wrong. It belongs under, I believe, the category of terrorism. Okay, well, let, let's, just compare, let's, let's just compare this bloodshed real quick. Let's break it down. These uh, numbers I've got here are specifically starting since 1973 with that famous case. What was the name of that famous case? Roe versus Wade. That was 43 years ago. Can you believe that? That number, 57,762,000, comes after only 43 years. Now, there were abortions going on before, but you know what? Most of the time they were botched. There were serious health side effects afterwards. Women lost their lives in the process of abortion. And it was becoming an epidemic, especially after the free love movement. Love whoever you want. Don't worry about marriage. Make love wherever you want, with whoever you want. Don't worry about marriage. And guess what? Pregnancies went through the roof out of wedlock pregnancies. And so they had to come up with an answer. And instead of turning to God's word, many in the nation turned to the convenient solution. Well, we didn't have to sacrifice for God. We didn't have to sacrifice for a child. We would do things the way we wanted to do them. When we look at God's word, we've got to call it like it is. Nobody gave me sugar to sugarcoat it this morning. I didn't see that in scripture. I didn't see it. This is serious. This is painful. I bet you'd be surprised by how many people you and I know who have had to walk through the pain of an abortion. Most of them won't talk about it. But I want you, I want you, I want to draw our, we're still going to talk about ISIS. I, I, I'm not going to finish before I address what we need to, how we need to handle that. But what was Jesus' teaching about addressing the issues of others? What did he say we've got to do with our own problems? What did he say that you, you're talking about a speck in somebody else's eye and you've got a plank in your own? Say, Mike, how can you call terrorism the speck, the international terrorism, and you're saying abortion is the plank? Okay, all right, let's look at some numbers. Let's, let's look at some cold, hard facts. You know what? Let's, let's talk about war then. Let's, talk about, let's not talk about terrorism. Let's just go for wars. Let's see how many of our own men and women in this country we've lost to warfare. We've lost people to warfare. Vietnam conflict, World War I, World War II, the American quote-unquote civil war. Or as they say in my home state of Tennessee, the war between the states. Or as they say in eastern Tennessee, the war of northern aggression. Let, let's put all those wars together. Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, and the American Civil War. 1,330,000 lives lost. All those wars combined, that's how many, not even... Let's just round it up. Let's just say 1.5 million because I'm sure there's many we don't know about. Let's just round it up just to make things easier. I want you to compare 1.5 million men and women who gave their lives in defense of this country compared to 50, over 57 million defenseless children. Okay, let's break that down even more. Let's just go for the average. That's just shy of 1.5 million a year for the last 43 years. That's 25,000 on average every week, continuing to right now. That's 3,690 children aborted every day. You want to break it down to the hour? Let's break it down to the hour. 153 every hour. Let's go for 60 seconds. Three children. Three children. About every... I'm sorry, every minute. Every minute. Three children every minute, every 60 seconds. You can't tell me we don't have a beam in our own eye here in the United States of America when it comes to terrorism. How are we judging the value of human life? You think that's going to get better? You think that's going to get better? When you're looking at your television screen and you see these stories of international terrorism and Christians being martyred for their faith, the, the beheading, the bombings, the shootings, I want you to remember 
I want you to remember that every single human life lost should break our heart. Sometimes as we become cynical with seeing so much news, this, this era is so much different than it was 20 years ago because 20 years ago, we were not as obsessed with international events that was just starting to come onto the scene. World War II is what shifted the tide on that. 60, 70 years ago, we just started to care. Now we are saturated with almost everything that is international events, and we have a tendency to go, oh, well, only three people were killed in that attack, so I guess it's not a big deal. Excuse me, every life lost is a big deal. Every minute you and I sit here, we're losing three of our own here in the United States. That's not a women's rights issue. You better take that out of that category. God never put it there, and it doesn't belong there in the church. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, where I started this whole series off with initially. 1 Peter chapter 1. See, we talk about terrorism. So I want us to include everything that needs to be on the discussion of terrorism. We need to discuss domestic terrorism. We need to discuss international terrorism. And we need to discuss the domestic terrorism here in the United States that is abortion. That should be in that discussion as well. We, we pray for solutions. We pray for advances in medications. We pray for advances in the health industry. We pray that our churches will grow. We pray that we'll see revival. We'll pray that the Lord will use this country and restore this country. And I don't know how we're going to get there if we're killing off the country. You understand what I'm saying? Because this didn't start with me. I'm, I'm just looking at the word and I'm seeing God's value for life. And he said, before I ever formed you, I knew who you were going to be. And it's as if he could stand here before us today and say, and I knew what they stopped you from doing. It's a rough subject. So I go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to verse 13. What are we to do? What are we to do in the face of all this? And so much death. Minute by minute, hour by hour. I'm glad I painted a pretty picture for you. Give you a good appetite for lunch. What do we do about it? Oh, is it is it over? Just throw our hands up? You you know where I'm going with this. What in the world do we do about all this death? The death that's happening on our own shores and the death that's happening around the world. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, in other words, in light of all of these things, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I want to hit the pause button for a second. Nowhere in Scripture do we find that we are to place our hope in conquering terrorism or in stopping abortion or in turning the moral tide of this country. Our hope isn't to be in those kind of movements. That's not where my hope lies. My hope doesn't lie in, in saying someday maybe we can stop all abortions here in the United States. That's not where my hope lies. I hope we can make an impact. And this church already gives to ministries that do make an impact and give, gives mothers choices and assistance and education on how to take care of their children so they don't resort to what has now become an easy option that should never have been an option in the first place. This church is already active in contributing. Whenever you give to this church, a percentage of what you give goes to help out that ministry. And we have the, uh, the tree that we put up here around the Christmas season where you can actually buy things for these mothers. The church, as an institution here, has done their best to walk forward in this. But that doesn't mean any of us are off the hook. We can't just throw money at the situation, go home, and pretend like we're not ministers. We are ministers. You have been called to a ministry and if you don't know what that is, then start praying about it. My ministry led me here to this church, now sitting behind a desk. I was standing behind a pulpit. I demoted myself. Don't worry. I'll be standing up here after another week. What is your ministry? Maybe it's not behind a pulpit or behind a desk. What is your ministry in your workplace? And what is it in relation to this culture of death? And how are you showing those around you that your hope is in Jesus Christ, not in this world get, becoming a better place. Not in this world becoming a better place, but in Jesus Christ destroying this world and bringing a new earth and a new heaven where he is king. There's no more sin and there's no more death. We won't be sitting here crunching numbers on terrorist activities. I won't be crunching numbers on the wars this country has had to face. You know how many wars we faced just in the last hundred years? 
I wouldn't be sitting here having to crunch numbers on the amount of children who are murdered in the name of progress and in the name of women's rights. I, wouldn't, I don't have to crunch those numbers on the new earth. There'll be no more death. Keep reading with me in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all behavior. Now flip back to our Romans 12 as we, as we wrap up. Go back to the end of Romans chapter 12, the beginning of Romans 13. How do you combine? How do you combine this? How do you, how do you reconcile the fact that we're to keep our hope on Jesus Christ and yet thousands and thousands of people are dying every day? Not just abortion. Let's expand that picture back out now to all terrorism, all acts of terrorism. People killed specifically by other human beings seeking to harm other human beings just for the sake of doing it in the name of a political or religious movement. Not by necessity, not in self-defense, but just to terrorize the population, to coerce them to obey their political or religious viewpoint. What do we do about that? The needless, senseless killing. How do we as a church, how do we respond to that? Let's go back to verse 14. Let's go back to the basics. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Now, I'm, this is coming to you live from the newsroom here. This is the living word of God. This is from the Apostle Paul's letter written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church in Rome in the first century under a government that hated Christians. Under a government that hated Christians. They were living under a terrorist-type government. They would coerce to get their way. They, there was no... There was not a, a lot of diplomatic talks being done. There was diplomatic talks within the government being done, but when it came to conquering other nations, you can forget it. But we've got to be fair. We've got to go across the whole border and recognize the terrorism that's growing within these shores too. I'm not just talking about Timothy McVeigh. I'm not just talking about school shootings. I'm talking about abortion as well. We've got to include that in this topic because the abortion... Are the abortions being performed in self-defense, yes or no? Say, so Mike, what about medical issues? Okay. Number one, you take each of those, usually as an exception, it's usually, statistically, it is the exception that babies are aborted because of medical issues. And in those small statistics, Usually there were options. There was not an easy way out of that situation anyway. It would have been just as difficult to do abortion as it would have been to keep the baby either way. You can't, you can't throw that in the face of God's design, and that's the number one reason we're going to talk about that this morning is it's not in God's design. That is not God's plan for us to terminate the life of a child. I call that terrorism. So what do we do? What do we do? When it comes to international terrorism, acts performed against this country, against this state, and against brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, we are called, number one, first of all, the first action, the first practical action we're to take is to pray for our enemies. I've said this a dozen times from this pulpit. We're to pray for our enemies. Don't underestimate the power of that. Intentionally pray for them. That the Lord will save them. Because we cannot on one hand say that we want to defend all of these defenseless children and at the same time, at the same time, wish death over somebody else. All the human life is valuable to God. And you say, Mike, what if that human life is hurting others? Well, there is such a thing as self-defense, but I'm talking about what we do over here. If, if we have a terrorist encounter this body of believers, I hope we have body, the believers in this body who will stand up and protect this body of believers by taking defensive and, if need be, even fatal action against those who want to cause harm to this church. You can complain about it all you want, but you'll probably be grateful if you have a second chance at life because somebody decided to commit justice against somebody trying to commit a crime.
That's in God's design. This is rough stuff. There's, a, there's no cut and dry easy solution, but there is a clear command, and it is to pray for our enemies. So what do we do about terrorism? We don't get obsessed with it. We don't get overwhelmed by it. God is still on the throne. God knows that victory is coming. Jesus Christ is already victorious over all terrorists. He's already had, he's got their sentence laid out, and they're not going to go sit in Gitmo for years at, our, at, at God's expense. That judgment, when we stand before the Lord, there is no deliberation by the jury. The holy judge will say, you killed. You killed. And you say, who? Here's the twist at the end of this message, and now watch this. Who will we be sentenced for killing whenever we get to heaven's gate? Jesus Christ. If we're not found in the person of Jesus Christ, who put Jesus Christ on the cross? You tell me that. We did. What did it say? Our sins put him there. But there's an opportunity. Here's the irony of it all. The terrorists who, who may have killed thousands of people here, they're not going to hell because they killed those people. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. There's not even a quote-unquote special place in hell for them. Get over that. You're not going to find that in the Bible. There's nothing special about hell for anybody. The terrorists who kill people on the, that you see on the television screen, you see on your smartphone in the breaking news, they're going to hell because they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ and they never came to place their faith in him. You and I sitting here this morning, maybe you've never performed a single terrorist act in your life, but if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will be in hell because you murdered Jesus Christ with your sin. I know, we wanted to get here and talk about terrorism and get mad at the terrorists and get all up in arms and start clapping about all the justice we're going to bring to the terrorists. I hope this country brings justice to the terrorists. I hope they eliminate the terrorist threat. But reality tells me this world's going to keep getting worse and we're going to keep breeding terrorists and we're going to be fighting this and we need to be fighting it and we need to be standing on guard and we need to be on defense. But that's not our number one mission. We can't get obsessed with it. We need to be responsible with it. Our number one mission here at this church is to save the people we have here in our own church community and in our own community around us. There are people, if you're telling me there's no lost people here in this church, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. There are people here in this church who've been trying to do their best but have never come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. They've never accepted his blood sacrifice. And if they try their best, if you try your best this morning and come to God without a blood sacrifice, how's that going to go? Not well. God doesn't sit there, and, and as much as we would like this, God doesn't sit there and go, well, you did the best with what you had, so go ahead and come on in. He says, no, the only way to the Father is through the... You know, this morning, you have an opportunity to get that murder charge cleared off of your account this morning. Maybe you already have. Maybe you know that your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life already. You've already placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've repented of your sins, and you say, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Then guess what? You're not on the terrorist watch list anymore. And, and if you know someone who has walked through a situation like an abortion or something similar, and you're saying, I, I'm not going to be the one to tell them this stuff. Okay, well, I want you to think about two things. One, God's the one saying this stuff. Two, if you don't love these people enough to share with them, to share with them the eternal life found in Jesus Christ, if, you're not, if you don't love these friends enough to share with them that they are dead in their sins, if you don't love these people enough to do that, I don't think you're as much of a friend as you think you are. Now remember, what did I say? Whenever I point fingers out here, what's always pointing back at me? I've had to walk this road. I've had to walk this road of saying, well, you know, I, I'm so obsessed with wanting to bring this person to Christ that I don't want to offend them. Well, wait a second. If I'm bringing them to Christ, I'm bringing them to the cross, and the cross of Jesus Christ is offense to those who don't believe. We've got to speak the truth. We speak the truth in love. There's a reason he told us to do that, because he knew if we got on fire for something as humanity, you know, we're just, there's going to be a lot of us who are just going to go out there, guns ablaze, and popping bullets off. 
And he said, no, put the guns down. Put the guns down. You go out there in the form of a servant. You go out there in the form of a servant just like Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ could have called 10,000 angels to stop the entire Roman government. I'm sorry, but one angel is disastrous enough. He could have just used one. He said he could have called 10,000 angels to stop that death process from happening, to stop us from killing Jesus Christ with our sin, from, to stop us from being terrorists, if you will. And yet he followed through with that death so that we could have salvation, so that terrorists could have salvation. This week, if you're, if you're still struggling with this topic of terrorism and how we respond to it, there's, it's, the, the, the answer is simple. We pray for our enemies. We pray for That's the initial and number one priority there. And if you were like me and after 9-11, now don't laugh, you know, but I, I was 12. I was 12 when 9-11 occurred. I was 12. And you know what I did? You know what I thought about whenever I was laying there in bed at night? I want to go over there and I want to take out every terrorist cell in the Middle East. Of course, I didn't know how many were here in the United States at the time. But I was obsessed with saying, they'll never come to Jesus Christ. They're terrorists. They've been terrorists. They'll always be terrorists. And I classified them. I put them in a box, put it on the shelf. And I said, I've got this figured out. We're going to eliminate all the terrorists and that will eliminate this threat. The Apostle Paul was a terrorist against the Christians. And because Jesus Christ showed himself to the Apostle Paul and saved him, we have some of the best writings in Christian doctrine under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in all of history. Who knows what else the Lord could do if other terrorists are brought to him, repenting of their ways and making him their savior. We don't like this. It's kind of un-American to talk about that, but guess what? My number one allegiance is to God's kingdom. I'm uncomfortable saying some, some of the things I see Jesus wanting me to do as an American. I go, well, Jesus, you wouldn't have been a good American. And he's probably thinking, good. Look at what's going on here, folks. Uh, America has done a lot to honor God initially and in how it built this country, and we're seeing that slip away because the world wants nothing to do with God because whenever there's light, darkness is going to run, and the darkness keeps climbing up the chain of command in this country, and it's pretty much to the top. Pretty much to the top. And if we don't shine the light down here, it's going to keep getting worse. Our faith isn't in the next presidential election. Our faith isn't in winning over human rights like we've talked about. Our faith isn't in eliminating all terrorist threats. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, and we want to see all the whole world, including terrorists, come to him. Amen? Amen. Right now, you've got an opportunity to take that murder charge off your record. I'm going to lead us in an invitation, and I want you, as the Lord moves you, as the Lord moves you to come forward and make that decision to give your life over to him, to accept the sacrifice. He already sacrificed his life for you. He doesn't have to do it again. It's already been done. If you die without accepting this salvation, you rejected that gift. You rejected that gift. Maybe it's not that serious for you this morning. Maybe you just have something you want to share with his family because you have been bought by the blood of Christ and you're walking with him and now you want to share what Christ has done since he has brought you into new life, since that murder charge has been removed, since, since you're a child of the king, you want to share what God's been doing. This is the time to do that. Please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you and seek your strength and your guidance on this subject. Lord, when we talk about terrorism, anger wells our hearts and then our hearts are broken broken for those who are hurting. Lord, show us how to reach out to those who are hurting. We thank you for the missionaries we have here that are overseas in these areas where the terrorists are destroying lives, and these people are ministering faithfully day after day, their own lives being shaken, their own lives at risk, and they just keep shining your light, sharing your truth, being your healing and compassionate hand. Lord, may we do that here. May we do that here. And while we're doing it, may we be praying for these enemies. Lord, it's not out of control. It's not out of control. You're still on the throne. You're still going to be victorious. You've been victorious through the cross. We just lose sight of our king. That's what makes the difference. Lord, may we not lose sight of you when we look at issues like terrorism, when we look at issues like abortion. May we, like we read in Romans, may we keep our hope fixed on you. And may we just pray, have the strength and power to pray for these enemies. May you restore anybody this morning, Lord, that is an enemy of the cross. May you restore them to come over to your side through Jesus Christ. 
Thank you, Mr. Clark. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 480. If you, by the Holy Spirit's power,